हेलो फ्रेंड्स कैसे हैं आप सभी आई एम श्योर यू मस्ट हैव अगेन रिवाइज एक्सप्लोर न्यू डायमेंशंस ऑफ आवर थियरीज रिलेटेड विथ अर्बन सोशोलॉजी स्पेशली ऑफ डरखाइम फर्डिन एंटोनिस एंड जॉर्ज सिमल एंड एज आई टोल्ड यू इन माई प्रीवियस सेशन that our succeeding session will also be on another set of theories but with a slight variation and that is theories of urban ecology wherever you come across urban sociology whether in indian context or in a global context the discussion of urban sociology is incomplete until and unless we don't talk about urban ecology so this itself speaks about the significance of this session so before i discuss about what are the theories of urban ecology first let me explain you the term ecology ecology basically is nothing but study of interdependence of man and environment but when we talk specifically about urban ecology it is concerned with the patterns of urban community arrangement and changes in terms of socio economic status life cycle and ethnicity it also deals with patterns of relations across the structures of cities of particular concern is the dynamic evolution of cities and contrast in urban structure across different time periods and different societies you remember we spoke about ancient cities medieval cities and modern cities so the notion of community is central dimension of urban ecology a significant principle of ecological approach is that the aggregation of persons into communities has important implications on spatial social and cultural outcomes so we will be talking about three prominent theories in this park and burgess homer hoyt and ullman now to begin with let us start discussing about theory of park and burgess during 1920s robert park and ernest burgess developed a distinctive program of urban research in sociology department at university of chicago in numerous research projects focused on the city of chicago park and burgess elaborated a theory of urban ecology which proposed that cities were environments like those found in nature and governed by many of the same forces of darwinian evolution that affected natural ecosystems the significant ecological principles which are reflected in city which you can also see on your screen firstly concentration it occurs with the growth of towns and cities concentration refers to a population increase in a given area as determined by the population density the second one is dominance it is when one area in the city tends to have controlling social and economic positioning relation to other areas another process is that of centralization the various institutions and establishments are drawn together along lines of transportation and communication this is followed by another process of decentralization which is the scattering of functions from the main districts to the outlying districts another important principle which you can see on your screen is invasion it occurs when new types of people institutions or activities enter an area previously occupied by a different type succession it occurs when the new population or new function gains dominance ecological segregation is also an important principle it arises from the fact that people differ according to ethnic grouping religion social class or occupation burgess described the changing spatial patterns of residential areas as a process of invasion and succession
Ernest Burgess concentric theory is a very important theory of urban ecology which says that cities grow, expand and develop outwardly in concentric circles that is continuous outward process of invasion and succession. This model is known as the concentric zone model because the different locations were defined in form of rings around the core urban area around which city grew. This theory defines how different social groups are located in a metropolitan area. Social groups based on the socio-economic status of households and distance from the central area or downtown. Concentric zone model was developed between 1925 and 1929 based on the study of American cities. Chicago city was studied for which Burgess provided empirical evidence. The center is the oldest part of the city around which the city expands over time and the newest development comes on the edges. The jobs, industry, entertainment, administrative offices, etc. were located at the center in the central business district. Dear friends, you can have a look at the image of this imagination on your screen to begin with the first zone is the central business district in this particular theory. So CBD central business district is the center or the innermost zone where the central business district is located and has highest land value. The zone has tertiary activities and earns maximum economic returns. This area is accessible owing to the convergence and passing of transport networks through this part from surrounding and even far places in the city. This part has tall buildings and noticeably high density to maximize the returns from the land. Commercial activities taking place in the area results in negligible residential activity in this zone. Friends, see the second zone on your screen. Second zone is of transition zone. The mixed residential and commercial use characterizes this zone. This is located adjacent and around the central business district and is continuously transforming that is transition takes place. The activities in this zone are of mixed nature that is land use, car parking, cafe, old buildings. This zone is considered to decay because of a large number of old buildings. This zone had a high population density when industrial activities were at their peak. Those residing in this zone were of the poorest segment and had the lowest housing condition. The third zone is that of inner city or working class zone. This area is occupied for residential purpose and is also known as inner city or inner suburbs. It consisted of houses built to accommodate factory workers but had better condition than the transition zone. This area has a mix of new and old development and generally requires orderly redevelopment. People living in this zone are second generation immigrants as many move out of the transition zone to this zone whenever affordable. This zone is nearest to the working area with modest living conditions and this resulted in reduced commuting cost. Another interesting feature includes the large rental housing occupied by single workers. The fourth zone is that of outer suburbs or white collar homes. This zone had bigger houses and new development occupied by the middle class. 
many of the homes are detached and unlike single occupants of inner suburbs families resided in these homes better facilities are available to the residents like parks open spaces shops large gardens but this comes at an increased commuting cost the fifth zone which you are seeing on your screen is commuter zone this is the peripheral area and farthest from cbd and thus results in highest commuting cost when compared with other zones people living in this part were high income groups which could afford large houses could pay commuting charges had access to different kinds of transportation mode enjoy modern facilities like shopping malls etc low rise development large gardens less population density is some of the characteristic of this zone this theory suggests positive correlation between economic status and distance from downtown that is better the economic status more is the distance from the central area there were several limitations of concentric zone model also although widely appreciated in united states of america burge's model is not applicable outside america this is so as the pattern of growth and expansion of cities is different because of various circumstances the relevance of this model has reduced over a period of time the model does not take into consideration influence of political forces and the restrictions imposed by the government for the improvement of living conditions this model is not applicable to post industrial cities as many cdb exists in such towns every city is different and has its own uniqueness and the factors influencing the growth of a city are diverse friends before we begin with homer hart's sector theory we have to remember one very important aspect that the post industrial cities or the modern cities or the post globalization cities they are completely different and the time when this burgess theory was given that time the socio economic conditions of city were different so naturally the expansion of any city or the structuration of any city and the use of the space and land available varies from time to time depending upon what kind of needs of the people is evolving so 100 years back human needs were different today human needs are different so cities are response to such kind of structures and requirements according to this theory city develops not in concentric circles but in sectors each sector is characterized by different economic activities the entire city can be thought of as a circle and various neighborhoods as sectors radiating out from the center of that structure you can also see the image on your screen Hoyt model is similar to Burgess model and is often considered as its improved version. Hoyt argued that cities do not develop in the form of simple rings; instead, they have sectors. Homer Hoyt suggested that few activities grow in the form of sectors, which radiates out along the main travel routes or links. activities in a sector are considered to be the same throughout the sector because of the purpose or function it serves land use within each sector would remain the same because like attracts like the high class sector would stay high class because it would be the most sought after area to live so only the rich could afford to live there 
the industrial sector would remain industrial as the area would have a typical advantage of a railway line or river. These sectors can be housing, industrial activities, etc. These sectors grow along railway lines, highways or rivers. The important components of Hoyt model which you can also see on your screen. First is central business district which is placed at the center. Sectors and the partial rings of land use activities take place. This area is often known as downtown and has high rise buildings. Industry. Industries are represented in the form of a sector radiating out from the center. These form sector because of the presence of a transport linkage along which the activities grew. The presence of railway line, river or road would attract similar activity and thus a continuous corridor or sector will develop. Apart from the industries, this area also serves as a residential area for the lower class workers. Living conditions are bad because of the proximity to industries. The other component is that of low class residential. The low income groups reside in this area. Narrow roads, high population density, small houses with poor ventilation exist in this area. Roads connect to the industries where most of the people in this sector work. The closeness to industries reduces the travel cost and thus attracts industrial workers. Environmental and living conditions are often inadequate because of the proximity to factories. Middle class residential. This area has middle income groups who can afford more substantial travel cost and want better living conditions. The activities of people residing in this area consist of different activities and not just work, the industrial work. It has more linkages than CBD along with some linkages to the industries also. This area has the most significant residential area. As you can see on the screen friends, high class residential is the outermost and farthest area from the downtown. Wealthy and affluent people live in this area. This area is clean, has less traffic, quiet and has large houses. Corridor or the spine extending from the CBD to the edge has the best housing. This model's significance lies in the fact that to explain the land use pattern it incorporates both ecological factors and economic rent concept also. There is stress on the role of transport routes in affecting the spatial arrangement of the city. Both the distance and direction of growth from the city center are considered. The theory brings location of industrial and environmental amenity values as determinants in a residential place. Like Burgess model, even this model has certain limitations. The model reflects consideration of only railway lines for the growth of sectors and do not make allowances for private cars. It is a monocentric representation of cities according to some experts. Multiple business centers are not accounted for in this model. The physical features may restrict or direct growth along specific wedges. There is no reference to out of town development. Friends, irrespective of its limitations, one thing which is very clear is this theory at least made an attempt in the initial years after industrial revolution to explain about the structure of the city. Harris and Ullman's multiple nuclei theory is a more advanced 
stage of urbanization and its explanation. The multiple nuclei model of 1945 by C. D. Harris and Edward Ullman is based on the argument that cities have multiple growth points or nuclei around which the growth takes place. This model was given in an article by them the nature of cities. According to this theory, cities do not have a single center but have many mini centers and you can see this on the image on your screen. Similar activities locate in the same area and create mini cities within the larger city. Certain areas activities tend to locate where they are most effective, desirable and financially feasible. The multiple nuclei model is an economic model created by Chauncey Harris and Edward Ullman in 1945. This model describes the layout of a city and again is based on Chicago. It says even though a city may have begun with the CBD or central business district, it will have other smaller CBDs develop on the outskirts of the city. If other CBDs develop on the outskirts of a city, there would be around valuable housing areas to allow shorter commutes to the outskirts of the city. Harris and Ullman argued that cities do not grow a single nucleus but several separate nuclei. Each nucleus acts like a growth point. The theory was formed based on the idea that people have greater movement due to increased car ownership. This increase of movement allows for the specialization of regional centers. The number of nuclei around which the city expands depends upon situational as well as historical factors. The activities listed in the model can be considered as independent zones which influences activities around them. These are also formed because of their dependence on one another when such activities are located in proximity a nuclei is said to be developed. There are certain important components like central business district, light manufacturing, low class residential, middle class residential, upper class residential, all this which you can see on your screen followed by heavy manufacturing, outlying business district, residential suburb and the industrial suburb. The theory also makes interesting observations about the placement of classes. With reference to low class, uh, the low class residential areas are closer to the manufacturing jobs which tend to be non-minimal skilled jobs. They also tend to have low wages which in turn lead to a low class resident. The medium class, the medium class residential area tends to be close to the central business district. It also has more space to spread out to support the population which is doing the skilled labor jobs. The high class residential areas tend to be on the outskirts of the medium class residential area. The area is also touching the outlying business district. The jobs that the people in this district do are usually skilled labor and have high incomes. The, it also talks about effects on industry. As multiple nuclei develop, certain types of transportation like airports are created. Those allow industries to be established with reduction in the transportation cost. These transportation hubs have negative effects also. Some effects are noise pollution and lower land values. Hotels are also built around airports because people who travel want to be near their source of transportation. The multiple nuclei model was considered 
much better than previous simple models which attempted to explain the structure of urban areas. However, this model also has its limitations. The model is not applicable to many cities and does not entirely explain the structure of urban areas. The size of the city is extremely important in the formation of nuclei since small or new towns are usually scattered and do not have a very well defined location. This model by Harris and Ullman considers limited activities which are considered in the model along with very rigid and specific boundaries of the activities. The height of the buildings is not considered and there is non-existence of abrupt divisions between zones. Each zone displays a significant degree of internal heterogeneity and not homogeneity. The role of inertia forces is not elaborated in this model and the influence of physical relief and government policy is also not considered. The concepts may not apply to Asian cities with different cultural, economic and political backgrounds. Friends, we have discussed three theories in this particular session. Some of you may find it little overlapping, little complex. So, please recall when I was talking about white paper introspection. You can see the images of all these three theories and make your own introspective points so that you are able to appreciate each theory and also differentiate each theory. Apart from this, one thing which I would really like to impress upon all of you is these models, they may not be exactly relevant in today's time because the causes of urbanization in today's time and its consequences and keeping in view the technology solutions, all these aspects have undergone lot of changes when compared to the time in which these theories have been suggested. But still, we have to appreciate these thinkers because after industrial revolution, when entire human society was in a phase of transition, so much of fluctuations was going on, these thinkers, these urban ecologists made a wonderful attempt to give a theoretical understanding so that it helps us to understand the problems of the urban areas. So, of course, every theory will have its respective strength and its limitations. And you can also compare this respective theories with regard to your own city also. And in this comparison, if you think you want to share something with me or you would like to write to me on any of these things, please feel free to write to me and reach out to me on pandevini at gmail.com. And very short, I will come back with a new session and in that new session we will also talk about two more wonderful thinkers. One is Patrick Geddes and another is Lewis Worth and these both names you have frequently heard in various sessions on urban sociology. So till then be happy, be safe, take care, feel free to write and explore because life is all about exploring and cities also have to be explored. So thanks a lot. See you in the next session. Bye-bye.